Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. For perennial gardeners, the most exciting and challenging task is layering for progressive flowering. Today, designer and grower Tom Peace illustrates how to make the transition between seasons with plants that can stand up to neglect. On tour, let's visit his spring garden in Lockhart. Tom and Diane Peace are at home in Lockhart when spring hits Central Texas. A nurseryman and designer, Tom also writes about the challenges of layering a perennial garden in tough conditions. It's a topic especially close to home, since when the spring garden gives way to their summer perennials, they head to Colorado until fall, where Tom continues his design work and plant propagation. He brings some of them back to Lockhart to continue growing the plants he's found on worldly expeditions, ones that can stand up to Central Texas, even when you're not around to tend them every day. His own garden is a test ground for some of the plants he sells to nurseries and a testament to layering for seasonal evolution. But in 1991, when he and Diane first settled in, it was new ground to furnish. The backyard was not a garden yet. It was a uh, clothesline poles and shed and a uh, row of oleanders and lawn and the big trees that we have. Over time, Tom turned the standard backyard into more than a privacy break between houses. The two forms of structure are one, the perimeter, either done by plantings or fencing, and then the core structure of plants, the bones of the garden, whether they're palms or shrubs or uh, agaves, yuccas, and those uh, high profile power plants, you know, the ones that you can do everything else around in the garden, but they hold their own, they're center stage all year round. Against them, he plays off the seasons, especially spring, with annuals and perennials that favor the heavy black clay soil and tempered shade. When I first came to live uh, in Texas, I was here only seasonally. And, and still am, so I was here for the winter season. So what I noticed were those plants, the uh, cool season bulbs, the ephemerals, the blue bonnets, the, the, the wildflowers, and how they filled that seasonal niche. As a plant globetrotter, Tom is always testing the limits of what can grow in a Lockhart backyard. As a gardener, he imagines how each space will look in the seasons to come and then I would layer under those plants that would come up in the hot season so the garden wouldn't just be a, a wasteland, but it would have something uh, that would continue to progress and, and grow into it. But it's mostly based on this is when I'm here, this is when I'm outside enjoying the garden, being in the garden, and uh, it, it remains my greatest pursuit to encourage people in Central Texas, certainly, to garden in the wintertime. I know there's a huge uh, excitement and thrust to garden now that spring's here, but if you are out in October and November, uh, you can plant a world of, of things to enjoy all winter long and into the spring. And many times with really wonderful weather, not so many mosquitoes, fire ants are at bay. Uh, it's, it's, a different, it's a different experience to be out in the garden. This is my style, uh, not that I invented it, but that I've adopted. And it, it is partly inspired by what I see in the wild. If I'm, if I'm hiking in the, the mountains or in the woods or traveling to other countries and looking at uh, wild floral displays, even you know sometimes what you'll see in the hill country or in central Texas in spring on good years, you'll, you'll see both you know, the large uh, palette expanse of color and sometimes you'll see, you know, little exciting vignettes where you have, you know, a rain lily up with a blue bonnet and an Indian paintbrush, and you see a combination of textures and colors that works, and, and that is inspirational. And you'll take that home and you recreate it. Sometimes with the same plants, sometimes with others. But uh, if I was to give the style of this garden a name, I'd call it controlled chaos. There's there's a certain amount of both elements, and they're not in opposition, but they they kind of uh, are both in play at any one time. 
paramount to a style is endeavoring a habitat for wildlife. Along with water and natural food sources, he plants tier density for nesting and protection. He values leaf cover, a natural soil amendment for heavy soil, but also to shelter insects and lizards that take care of the garden when he's away. In his commercial greenhouse in Lockhart, Tom forges his travels, experiments, and homegrown experience to introduce gardeners at local nurseries to his discoveries. Although some of his vines are ephemeral, to be replanted next year, others carry on through freeze and drought, ready and waiting when he and Diane return from Colorado. I will coddle things to a point, to give them the best chance, but then, you know, I'm gone for half a year and they're on their own. Um, those things that survive, you know, survive with a little bit of help from our friends and uh, they, have to be, they have to be tough enough. There are aspects that are out of my control. Uh, there are aspects that I can control a little bit and that I influence and, and try to finesse, but uh, a lot of times it's, it's in the hands of other, <laughs> other forces, certainly. Well, from the garden to the gardener, we're Tom Peace is now joining us here in the studios of KLRU and Central Texas Gardener. Welcome to the program. Great to have you back, Tom. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, your garden, uh, a profusion, uh, just a really heady mix of different kinds of things. I know you really like to um, add all different kinds of things together, have a lot of fun with it. And it's really kind of a cool season garden, isn't it? Uh, well, there are a lot of structural bones that last through mm -hmm. the... Uh, summer as well, but the, the, the pomp, the mm -hmm. flesh of color, all that is, is a cool season mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. And that begins for me in, in November when I start you know, planting. Uh, it lasts all the way through, I'd say, March planting in yeah. some years. Well, you're, our, our topic today, Tom, is tr uh, cool season transitionals, plants that really brighten up the cool season and then either fade away entirely or go to sleep during our Central Texas summers. This is a good group of plants for you because you're not here in the summer, are you? <laughs> right, right, so I enjoy them when I can. You know, it's, it must be nice to have kind of a bifurcated life where you're here in the winter and you're in Colorado, correct? Uh, during the the, uh, the warm months, so uh, that's a nice way to garden. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite way to garden and it, it makes me appreciate the plants that uh, come alive during the cool season and mm -hmm. then uh, go to seed or go dormant or mm -hmm. uh, otherwise avoid summertime. Right. And you know, there's a, there's a, there's a nice thing about um, the plants that really kind of do come to life. I, March is one of my favorite times in the garden here because often it's just, that's the time to be outside. You know, we have so many beautiful, beautiful days at that time of year where we can have the prettiest days, in fact, of the year happening in March broken up by the occasional cold front. <laughs> right, or even like in this year, December. Yeah. I mean, December had some just stellar, clear, sunny days. Mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to be out in the garden, for me, and not have the mosquitoes be a problem, and right. just just enjoy. I can put on a coat if I need to, mm -hmm. uh, but for, for where I was raised, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. my ideal temperature is about 70. <laughs> yeah. So, you <laughs> right. know, the cool season gardening is definitely how right. I can enjoy myself. Well, you're definitely a plants person. Uh, you know, you, you're a garden author and you grow plants in the wholesale trade here in Texas. Yes. And you've got a whole bunch of cool things that you brought with you. So let's talk about some of these transitional plants for cool season. We have a group of plants, and I see we have kind of an edible theme going for some of these different groupings here today. But the, this first group contains beets and artichoke and cabbage and an herb uh, that, uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about feverfew on the garden before, but uh, talk a, uh, briefly about the group of plants here and then we can maybe zero in on a few of them. Okay, well, uh, artichoke is, is considered in Mediterranean climates to be a perennial. Sometimes it gets too wet in the summer and, yeah. and doesn't make it, but it usually will grow for a long time. Mm. It takes the cold of winter, but will produce a very large, almost canopy of, of silvery mm -hmm. uh, cut leaves. And then the artichoke bloom. This is a one called Violetta, which has a, a purple artichoke itself before it opens up with a purple oh, center. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the red cabbage, 
<coughs> excuse me, which is not red, but and more uh, purple. <laughs> yeah, kind of a gunmetal blue. Yeah, is is a beautiful foliage plant in the garden. It's one of one of my favorites, just because you can't get that color. Uh, elsewhere, mm -hmm. and as well as the bull's blood beet, which has that incredible garnet leaf, and if, once mm -hmm. it's growing in the garden, if it's backlit, the leaves just glow mm -hmm. with that beautiful red. Yeah. Um, they can be eaten later if you want to. The mm -hmm. reason I mix vegetables into the garden is, you know, mostly I like how they look. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> lettuces and, and such like that are also in my garden, and I, you know, harvest them when. I see fit at the end of their term. Well, perfect cool season plants for us here in Central Texas, and uh, it's fun to mix edible plants into the ornamental landscape. You know, uh, lots of bold colors, lots of bold forms mm -hmm. uh, in these plant families, and I think we can certainly see that there with the artichoke counterpointing, that the cool of the silver of that artichoke counterpointing the others is really great. Now, tell me about the fever few, because again, I don't think we've talked too much about that on the show. The fever few is a, a perennial in, in northern climates. Here it, it perennializes for a year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, usually too much water is the undoing uh, of a I lot see. of these plants. Yeah. And so last year in the drought, uh, in my garden, they did quite well. Okay. Uh, as well as beets and, and, and kales, Got a oddly enough. bright, happy green on it there. I really like it's it. It's a beautiful chartreuse color. Yeah. And that it makes other flowers that are with it really pop, whether there's something pedestrian like a pansy or mm -hmm. something a little more uh, rare and exciting. It mm -hmm. really brings out the colors. Well, we, you also brought a, a combination of different kales, mm -hmm. these three different forms. Uh, why don't you tell us about these? Well, these are all sold as uh, edible kales instead mm -hmm. of ornamental kales. And they're in their winter colors. So since mm -hmm. they've been outside and we've been you know, freezing, they've had a, a deepening of color in their leaves. The tallest, which is the dino kale or the black Tuscan kale, mm -hmm. has a beautiful like small palm tree shape yeah, and it absolutely. gets this this dark dark green uh, color to it and very very thick savoyed leaves mm. uh, easy to eat and enjoy in the garden at the same time because you can just pick leaves off as it, as it grows sure and the uh, frilly leafed red board kale normally is green in the summer when it's mm. when it's warmer and that will grow all summer long as well but the the cooler temperatures make it turn that really nice amethyst purple color uh, the last being the red chidori, which looks like an ornamental kale. Mm -hmm. It has a really hot magenta center right. and the purple outer leaves, but it's very, very uh, edible, quite mm -hmm. delicious. Well, beautiful plants, and as you say, delicious and, and fun to have in the garden for uh, eating purposes as well. Speaking of which, a couple of other plants that you brought along. This next one, again, another edible plant. Yes. I've never heard of Parcel before. Tell me about this plant. Uh, it was new to me too, which is why I tried it out. It's uh, uh, leaf celery, mm -hmm. uh, as it's called. And so it looks like parsley, but you can just you know cut a leaf and uh, put the whole leaf in your Bloody Mary mm -hmm. instead of a celery stock or mm -hmm. in soups on salads. Mm -hmm. And it has the, the flavor of celery, but it has a, a really nice ferny look. You can put it in the yeah. garden. It's, it's cold hardy. It, it makes the garden look alive. And then you can plant that on top of parts of uh, your garden that you have tender, uh, heat-loving perennials mm -hmm. that may be dormant in the wintertime. Therefore, you kind of breathe a little new life into that space. So these things can pop up and, uh, again, provide you with something to munch on. And, <coughs> well, well into early summer, too. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is gorgeous. I absolutely am crazy about the color on this flower. And uh, tell me a little bit about this. It, it's uh, common name is Cape Cowslip. Right, it's, it makes me sound. It sounds like South Africa Cape. It is. It okay. is. Okay, and um, the fact that the individual flowers look like candy corn makes mm -hmm. uh, it gives a whole new meaning to the term eye candy yeah. with flowers. <laughs> yeah. it really is something that is a, a pleasure to look at. You you uh, enjoy it for its mm -hmm. its brief bloom, although the the flowers are. are half of the interest, the leaves also have spots on them, yeah, so when cool. it grows in the fall, you can enjoy the foliage and then mm -hmm. it's in bloom, you know, maybe a, a little under a month, let's say. Okay. Uh, That's a good time, though, for a bulb plant. A, a, good, a good series of blooms, because once it becomes a clump, it'll kind of erupt over a long period of time. Okay. And uh, then it's summer dormant, so if you have it as a pot plant, you would put it in a sunny spot in your garden, maybe against the wall, mm -hmm. soft wall, so it has some cold weather protection. In the summertime, once it's dormant, you just put it on your porch so it stays dry, and don't worry about it until October when you set, set it out and it, water. Set it back out and mm -hmm. give it some water again. Well, I love that kind of plant, something that doesn't need to be watered. 
And I have to say, I love this Manfredo like foliage too. That, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the combination here of the, the really bright, eye catching eye candy, as you described it, and the spotted leaves, which is really cool. So a Cape cowslip, that's a good one for us to remember. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of other plants you brought along. Um, I'm familiar with calendula. I have never mm -hmm. seen a calendula of this color or this form before. This is one of the new hybrids. They're, they're trying to get the orange out of calendulas. <laughs> and bad orange, <laughs> bad. <laughs> they're doing all right, but yeah, some calendulas are sold as pink, and this, mm -hmm. uh, this one was uh, written up as supposedly uh, having pink tones. I would call it more of a peachy or yeah. apricot color. Mm -hmm. I but would the, go that way. Yeah. The reverse of the petals have that really nice uh, mm. marginal inking in red, mm -hmm. which right. brings you can it really, really see that. It's good clarity. absolutely beautiful. Uh, I love this color, and you mm -hmm. know, it, it still speaks orange to me, uh, but uh, really beautiful, beautiful form too. Love the the all those petals, right. really big show there. So that's great, and it'll bloom through May, you know, right. so starting in, in January, February, okay. March, April. You really get a a, a good. Uh, amount of show mm -hmm. in, a, in a cool season garden with certain plants, calendula being one of them. Yeah. Now we only have a, a few seconds here and I, I just want to briefly mention you also brought a form of oxalis mm -hmm. that you've named Scotty Surprise for our buddy Scott Ogden. Right. And where did he discover this species? Uh, he discovered it just on the on the trail, walking to a place that was selling dinnerware and, and uh, <laughs> statuary, and uh, never wanted to turn off the plant eye. He saw the double form, and, okay. and we got a little bit of it. Okay. Well, uh, Tom Peace, thank you so much for being a part of Central Texas Garden again. Tom Peace, author of Sunbelt Gardening, plant grower, and plant design and garden designer here in Aust in Austin. Based out of Lockhart, actually. Right, right. Good to see you again. And coming up next, it's Skip Richter. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question is about caring for fruit trees. You may have tried growing fruit before and not been successful, or maybe you've never tried and would like to, and of course you want to do your best job on the first try. Well, fruit care is important this time of year. This is a time when we're planting fruit trees, and uh, it's also a time if you've got fruit that's susceptible to scale, or if you've got a scale problem, that you want to apply your dormant oil sprays. You don't want to apply the oil within uh, 30 hours of a freeze, but you can apply oil of the good coating and control scale if it is a problem. Fruit trees that are established need to be fertilized now. Don't worry about fertilizing new trees. Let them grow at least six weeks before you start to feed them gradually. Their roots just aren't ready for additional fertilizer yet. But established trees can be fertilized now on through March. The best way to fertilize is to kind of use your thumb as a one inch gauge and see how thick the trunk is, about waist high or at the top of the trunk where it starts to branch. Uh, for every inch of trunk diameter, you would apply a pound, which is two cups of fertilizer. So if you had a fruit tree that was the size of a soft drink can, that might be about three inches, about three pounds of fertilizer. And again, two cups is a pound or a pint is a pound. So by fertilizing all throughout the branch spread area evenly and then watering it in well, that tree will have a good start on the season. If it's a young tree, you can continue to fertilize on through the year. If it's older trees, they don't need a lot of additional fertilizer in most cases. You also want to mulch your fruit trees now. Weeds are the number one thing that rob nutrients and water, more importantly, from the tree. So provide a good mulch underneath it, create that forest floor environment, and your fruit trees will do much better. There shouldn't be weeds in, underneath the branch spread of a fruit tree if you want it to do its best. And finally, it's time to make sure you finish the pruning chores. So call the extension office in your area and get a free pruning guide on how to prune the particular type of fruit tree you have. We want to complete pruning before they start blooming. This week's featured plant is Hinkley's Columbine. Hinkley's Columbine is one of our native columbines, native to West Texas and Mexico. It does very well here. Beautiful, large, uh, yellow flowers. Uh, it crosses with our other red native columbine to produce a very interesting combination uh, if it grows in the same area as the red columbine. I kind of like the combination a lot, too. These do well in dry shade areas. They're perennials, but individual plants don't tend to live too many years, but they reseed themselves as well.
Things to do in the garden include pruning your evergreens. If you've got a shrub hedge, make sure and keep the base wider than the top. That allows light to reach the lower areas and you have good dense foliage all the way through your shrubs. Mulch all your woody shrubs, keep the, that ground covered, keep the weeds out and protect those roots. And if you've got any root crops you wanna plant like radish and carrots and turnips, get those in or cold crops as well. For more information, for plant tips, or a way to contact the Extension Office in your area, visit klru.org slash ctg. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with John Tromkel for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Today we're going to include the front yard in the Backyard Basics segment. You know, um, we're seeing a lot of diseases in the lawns. It's rather dramatic, as a matter of fact. Brown patches out there, that's somewhat manageable. But take all, that's one that's really stressing the lawns and actually killing the lawns. So we'll talk a little bit about those two today. The city of Austin um, recommends uh, that you read these pamphlets, and really anybody in Central Texas and other cities would benefit from this kind of reading too. Maybe your city has some. Um, this helps you diagnose lawns problems. They also give you some good information on lawn care and how to manage weeds. And they do this with organic alternatives in there. You know, these diseases are just um, are devastating in the lawn. And I think that prevention is really the key. You know, when we're treating them when they're active, we've got to do a lot more work and we do lose a part of the lawn. So uh, prevention is really important. And this little pamphlet right here helps you to identify the diseases with the pictures in there so you'll know what you're dealing with. Not everybody knows all of the science about these things, so these are very beneficial. You know, sometimes the lawn gets really stressed and that makes them more susceptible. The droughts in the summertime really can lead into these problems. Another thing is the use of herbicides and the real strong chemicals out on the lawn. This distresses them too because the soil becomes unhealthy. Here in Central Texas, the Extension Service and the Grow Green program from the city of Austin is recommending that you do not use atrazine. These weed and feed products are getting into the creeks and streams, even Barton Springs has atrazine in it. This is a big problem. And so the Extension Service and the city say, don't use the atrazine anymore. You know, we don't normally feed uh, the spring garden until the middle of April. Anything earlier than that will run off. The grass can't take it, even with organic fertilizers that are slow release. So keep those things in mind. But as we get underway in the spring or in the fall, one of the things we want to do is apply some compost out there. Compost brings life to the soil. It really makes it richer. It makes the soil absorb moisture better. And so the life in the soil is critical to the health of the plant, any plant, including your lawn. And what we also do with this is, in order to prevent disease, we add a little bit of cornmeal to it. Cornmeal feeds a beneficial organism that lives in the soil or in the compost. And um, this is very important when you're trying to fight disease out there. And some warm, moist springs and moisture in the summertime can sometimes lead to these diseases. Some of the traditional things for just trying to stop it quickly are potassium bicarbonate. This is an actual fungicide. This is a new product on the market called Serenade. This one only works on the brown patch and not the takeoff. But this is a real good product if you identify brown patch out there. Usually the lawn is dying, but the runners are still green, but the leaves have died on it. This is a product that I really think is great. It uses a preventative technique. This is actinovate, and this is an agricultural streptomyces that will colonize the root system, giving it protection from the invading disease. The disease may still be there, but it can't get into the plant. But it's only good when you use it ahead of the problem. Now, keeping the soil alive, if you can't afford a bunch of compost, at least use one of the aerobic compost teas that are now available. Aerobic compost tea brings in the beneficial organisms that are in the compost, and it's a really good thing on all of the plants. Black spot on roses, diseases out on the lawns. This is another good way to keep the soil healthy out there. Now, the Extension Service is recommending Peat moss. They did some research up in the Dallas area using some different things out there, including the chemical fungicides. And that they found was that um, a little bit of compost certainly does a good job out there. But by reducing the pH of the soil with peat moss, this seems to be a real advantage at suppressing specifically the take-all. 
by having that lower pH around the roots of the plants and right around the rhizomes in there, it seems to really suppress the take-all rather dramatically. So when you're using peat moss out there, it would be something like one pound, one cubic foot bag would cover about 263 square feet. And the 3.8 bag usually is the most common one that's available out there. And that particular one covers a thousand square feet. I think it's an economical way to try to prevent it. We do whatever we can to prevent these things because replacing the lawn is really expensive. So some good soil building practices and some prevention techniques are the key to controlling diseases in the lawn. Make sure your mower's clean too. Don't let someone else come into the yard and inoculate. And also your tools need to be clean. Your gloves also and your shoes. All of these things are components of preventing diseases in the garden. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Check out klru.org slash ctg for more tips, online video, and our weekly blog. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash ctg to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org slash ctg.